I, I can't imagine what these parents are going through. Other moms in the area in other neighborhoods were contacting me saying, my daughter got thyroid cancer, my daughter. I mean, kids as young as 13 years old. Do you feel safe living here? I did. We cannot stick our head in the sand and say there's not a problem. I was very convinced that, you know, the coal ash is, um, you know, contaminating all of Mooresville. Decades of scientific evidence and medical research tell us there is no connection between coal ash, thyroid cancer, and ocular melanoma. Coal ash is not hazardous. favorite pictures of all time, but Keenan and me on her wedding day. I, I still remember the day she called me when she said, Dad, they found a tumor on my eye. And I went, what do you mean a, a tumor on your eye? And she said, it's melanoma. And I, mean, I didn't dare let on to her, but my heart just sank because I knew this wasn't good. Keenan Colbert was 23 when she was diagnosed with ocular melanoma a rare cancer that on average affects five in every one million people. We found out it's somebody typically like me that gets ocular melanoma. It's typically a white male in maybe their 50s or 60s. And the more research we did, we said this is just off the charts to have someone who's 23 years old, female, having ocular melanoma off the charts. Keenan was a fighter, though. She said, remove my eye. I don't want any cancer cells in my body. She fought for years, all the way to the end, the when the incurable cancer yeah. took her life. Uh, no. She was 28. <laughs> this is the end of the voicemail her dad, Kenny, still listens to every Father's Day. But Keenan's diagnosis and death sparked questions, questions that would soon lead to something much bigger than her family could have ever imagined. A few months later, there was a young lady by the name of Meredith Legg who was diagnosed with ocular melanoma. And I said, this is just very freaky that we've got two girls that are both in their early 20s that have been diagnosed. And then shortly thereafter, we found a couple of other people that lived in the area around Hopewell High School. So I said, this is very strange. Now we've got four females. Two went to Hopewell High School and two lived within sight of Hopewell High School. So that kind of started Hopewell as, as ground zero. Tonight, there is a mystery unfolding around a local high school that has seen a scary spike in cancer cases. Word started traveling via social media, you know, Facebook and things. And the next thing you knew, we were up to maybe eight or 10 or 12. And I said, oh, wow, something's up here. We've now got 12 people that either lived or worked on that side of Huntersville. It, and this is really off the charts. And yet not a penny from the state to investigate. I said, until we get some people angry and, and until we probably embarrass a couple of public officials, this is not going to go anywhere. But it's going to take a groundswell movement. It's going to take some, some people in our neighborhood and some people in Huntersville to demand action. Nobody can really tell us What's going on? And that's what happened. People are scared. People got mad. It's a giant issue, and there's not enough people involved. People got scared, and people got mad. Because, you know, people said, this could be my kid. You know, I, I've got a 10-year-old, a you know, and, and we don't know where this is coming from or the cause. Once more than a dozen confirmed cases of ocular melanoma were identified in Huntersville, the state passed a bill allocating $100,000 to investigate. That was April 2017. In the two years that followed, the number of confirmed cases doubled. In October, the grant money ran out. Good evening. The results of the investigation were shared with a packed room. Two years of geospatial research, genetic testing, and soil testing turned up nothing. And then this, so quick update. that you might have missed it. But I've talked with four new patients. The potential total now, 30. 
30 people in this town of 50,000 who have one of the world's rarest cancers. They told us, hey, we've done all this testing and it's inconclusive, but by the way, there's four new cases. Rob Kidwell, multi-term commissioner for the town of Huntersville. Well, it's frustrating. You know, we, we can't say that there's, you know, it's inconclusive or there's really no, you know, um, nothing connecting it and then say there's four more cases. Well, there's something there. There's something there. We have to look for it. What's your biggest frustration? How slow it moved. How slow it moved. Two years, no answers, and no more money. And right now there's no new testing scheduled. No. But that isn't the end of this story, because just down the road in the neighboring town of Mooresville, another mystery is unfolding. Uh, my name is Trisha Edmiston. I'm Danielle Bolger. No, my name is uh, Steve Durant. My name is Catherine Kalin. I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. 2010. And I was diagnosed when I was 13. Last January. This part of the story starts with Taylor Wind. And she developed a lump on her neck, on the side of her neck. They said it was a swollen gland, probably, and I shouldn't even worry about it. Her mom, Susan, pushed for more tests. And so seven weeks later, we get a diagnosis that she had thyroid cancer and it had spread throughout her whole neck. Taylor was just 16. She had thyroid cancer. Doctors had to slice open her neck to remove it. I just wanted to kind of uh, put that out there, the truth that she had cancer. And immediately that's where people started contacting me. Neighbors on my street came to me and they were like, we had thyroid cancer. Other moms in the area in other neighborhoods were contacting me saying, my daughter got thyroid cancer, my daughter. I mean, kids as young as 13 years old. And she started wondering, if maybe this wasn't all just a coincidence. I asked our doctor, is this normal that there's three thyroids cut out on my street? And she said, that doesn't sound right. But Susan didn't want to wait around for the state to allocate research money. She'd seen how slow things moved in Huntersville. I am truly humbled by all of you. So she raised over $100,000 to pay independent researchers at Duke University to investigate. The first thing the team did was validate Susan's fear. They confirmed I had a thyroid cancer cluster. The researchers pulled state data and found that there were 191 cases of thyroid cancer reported in Iredell County. Here, right down the road from an explicable cancer cluster, was another one. The thyroid cancer rate in Mooresville determined to be up to three times higher than normal, condensed mostly in these two zip codes. There's so many. Nobody connected the dots before Susan that something was wrong. Trisha Edmondson was diagnosed with thyroid cancer in January, one of the latest added to the list. I mean, there's too many people. There's just too many people. I mean, when you start, you know, going, walking down your neighborhood and you're like, they have cancer, they have cancer. When you even have animals that have it, there's dogs and cats that have thyroid in this area. And that, to me, that's crazy. Just like in Huntersville, many of the patients are young girls. I mean, sometimes there's days where, like, I cry. Like Catherine Canlis. I actually just had to have surgery again for the second time. And uh, it's harder now because I'm 25, so I have bills to worry about. A nursing student working two jobs, recovering and shocked to learn that she's not alone, not by a long shot. There could be something here affecting all of us and it actually happens to a lot of us. You can't miss the rows of for sale signs, and maybe you can't help but wonder if this is the reason. Well, we've been here 17 years. Do you feel safe living here? I did. <laughs> um, you know, it's either we're gonna stay and we're gonna fight and get answers, or we're gonna pack it up and, and move somewhere else. Danielle Bolger, mom of three young boys, was diagnosed with thyroid cancer last year. It's on my street alone, there's three of us. You know, they're testing everybody's soil and air and, and you know, slowly but surely, it seems like it's all connected. But how? If something is causing these cancers, what? And why are families who live here just now learning about it? The health department had all this data and you think they would let doctors know? So when people like me bring a kid to the doctor with thyroid symptoms, you would automatically do a blood, a blood test. But there are no answers to those questions, not yet. It's just being kind of swept under the carpet and people continue to be diagnosed. There's always a new phone call and a new patient, a new diagnosis. And I think until it happens to you directly, it's really easy to ignore. It's getting harder to ignore though. The anger, the fear, the growing numbers. It really appeared as though we had an issue on our hands that we had a, a, a cancer cluster in Mooresville. Mooresville Mayor Maya Atkins is frustrated. Nobody else 
is doing any kind of a study. A private citizen has to raise $100,000 to go figure out what kind of daughter's sick and what's happening in the community, yet there were no state dollars, there were no other funding uh, available to understand, well, what's taking place. He believes something is wrong, and he knows saying so won't always be popular among the constituents in this town that he represents and loves. I understand that people are concerned about their home values and they're concerned, you know, we cannot stick our head in the sand and say there's not a problem. We need to acknowledge that there, there's concerns, that we do have a problem, and then we got to find answers. The Duke University researchers still using the grant money raised by Susan identified and interviewed patients, tested their environments, their genetics. They tested the town's water. They tested schools for radon. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And then all eyes locked on the elephant on the lake. Duke Energy's Marshall Steam Station and the 17 million tons of coal ash sitting there in an unlined basin. The, the natural instinct would be the correlation between what well, we have all this coal ash and be toxic and then does that have some correlation to these cancers? It's like, well, what else could it be? Duke Energy spokesperson Paige Sheehan agreed to sit down with me to answer our questions. Is coal ash toxic? No. If I had a bottle of water here and I were to drink a bottle of water, that water is perfectly safe for me. If I were to drink 50 of them while I'm sitting here, that water would be toxic because it's the dose and the exposure that makes it toxic. Coal ash is not toxic any more than a bottle of water is. But isn't it a fact that heavy metals and some carcinogens are in coal ash? Yes, and they're also in soil and naturally occurring and they're in our environment all over the place. In April 2019, the Department of Environmental Quality ordered Duke Energy to close and fully excavate any and all remaining impoundments of coal ash, citing public health concerns. Duke filed an appeal asking instead to cap the ash in place, saying that would be both safer and more cost effective than moving it all to another location. A few months later, the utility company lost that appeal. They'll have to move forward with the excavation. Meanwhile, they maintain the ash is not harmful to the people who live nearby this plant. So if coal ash is the same as dirt or water, why are state agencies like the DEQ and federal agencies like the EPA requiring that they be closed, capped, excavated. I'm not suggesting that coal ash is the same as water. I'm talking about when you look at toxicity, it's about dose and exposure. There is a constituent in coal ash arsenic that is a carcinogen. The EPA has looked at that and studied it. They have determined that someone would have to have a very high exposure rate over a very long period of time, like inhaling it, for example, before they might face a health concern. Duke Energy says no, the coal ash in this basin is not lined, as current laws would require, but they say it is closely monitored. It's not in the air, in the soil, and in the water in any measurable way. But let's go back a few decades before coal ash and its potential health concerns made headlines. Records we uncovered from the DEQ show coal ash from the plant was once sold as construction material. People could pick it up by the truckload and bring it home. Was there a time that people could pick up coal ash and use it for construction fill, things like that? Back in the 1990s and the early 2000s, um, as our community was booming, there was uh, an interest in using coal ash as a structural fill. Duke often sold or marketed through a third party coal ash to outside uh, folks who wanted to improve their property. But absolutely, it was acceptable and, and uh, uh, regulated by the state. But that realization hit residents hard. Records show the ash was integral to the construction and housing booms in both Mooresville and Huntersville. A lot of this coal ash was used. Do we know where all of it went? Uh, we don't. We honestly don't, because at the time, it was legal to sell it or you know, use it. We've been living amongst you know, structure fill and coal ash for decades. Enter newly elected state senator Vicki Sawyer. The Coal Ash Management Act does allow for a certain percentage of coal ash to be used as beneficial fill is what they call it. And I just felt like that shouldn't be in our environment. Even though Duke Energy says they don't sell coal ash for construction anymore, Senator Sawyer filed a bill this year that would officially ban the practice statewide. That bill did not go anywhere. I think it just kind of just honestly just died because I didn't have enough horsepower as a freshman young senator to get it moving. Besides, she says the basins were being ordered to close anyway. 
And Duke Energy says the ash used for those projects contains less than 1% of trace elements like arsenic. But still, people began to wonder. The Duke University researchers have now begun testing the soil around the schools in the area that were built around the time coal ash was commonly used for construction. And they started asking questions of the men and women who transported and used it back then. Landscapers came to me. They had cancer. They said, yeah, it was mixed with topsoil and put it over hundreds and hundreds of lawns all throughout Lake Norman. The DEQ kept records of where the largest amounts of ash went. Anything over 10,000 cubic yards was noted down. Duke Energy says they only have 21 records of coal ash being used for what they consider to be smaller projects, averaging 50 cubic yards. Keep in mind, 50 cubic yards is about 90,000 pounds. And folks who are building homes and um, uh, gardeners sometimes that they can go up and, and grab a uh, truck, tr a uh, truck full of coal ash for for smaller uses. Those were not documented. Senator Sawyer admits she's not sure what to think about that, but she's hesitant to say it's what's causing the cancer. I'll be honest, when I first started looking at all of this, I thought that that was absolutely the boogeyman in the room. I was very convinced that, you know, the coal ash is, um, you know, contaminating all of Mooresville. It's easy to make that assumption, but you cannot prove it. So what kind of person am I or what kind of legislator am I being if I purposefully mislead people when I truly don't know the answer myself? Although coal ash contains toxic substances like arsenic, lead, and mercury, there's been no research directly linking coal ash to thyroid cancer or ocular melanoma. But people who live here, people who are getting sick, argue there haven't been any studies that officially rule it out either. I asked scientists all over this country, including the ones at Duke University that are helping me, I said, is this safe? And they say, no should be treated as hazardous waste. It's loaded with toxic chemicals. So, I mean, is that what caused all these cancers? We can't say that, but until the state proves that I can have my kids rolling around with it in the yard, and there's no way that this could be linked through ingestion or inhalation, could have caused anyone's illnesses in that town. Until they can prove this, I'm not going to take the utility company's word for it. Are you 100% certain that the coal ash has no link to any of those cancer cases? Decades of scientific evidence and medical research tell us there is no connection between coal ash, thyroid cancer, and ocular melanoma. See, I wasn't aware of any third-party study that definitively said there's no way coal ash causes cancer. Am I wrong? I can tell you coal ash does not cause thyroid cancer and ocular melanoma. I asked for a copy of any research that conclusively ruled out coal ash as the cause of these cancers. You said there are studies out there that prove there was no link. I just asked if you could send me. I haven't seen any of that, so I'd love to take a look. A Duke Energy spokesperson later clarified that actually no such research exists. Again, pointing to the fact that there's no study definitively proving a link either. We still need to consider that as a hypothesis, but that can't be our only hypothesis because we're going to skew the results. But many people living in these clusters say they want to know for sure. It's, it's like shocking and nauseating and we have a water filter and I haven't gone on the lake since I've been diagnosed. I don't want anything to do with it, quite honestly. And many believe the fact that there are two apparent cancer clusters in our great state in neighboring towns is something that just can't be ignored. It is uncanny, right, to have all of these things in the same general region. I think we'd be short-sighted not to look that there isn't a connection. To have two clusters of different cancers and within a three-town radius uh, is, should be a very alarming for a lot of people. If you're still wondering whether this is all just a coincidence. I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer in 2010. Consider Steve Durant. And then in 2017, I was diagnosed with ocular melanoma. Diagnosed with both cancers. While living smack in the middle of the clusters. It's, it's very frustrating. I mean, there's got to be something there. There's, there's just no way, I just can't put two and two together, that there's something environmentally, something in that area that would cause so many people to get this. I remember, you know, being there for a little while, and, and my wife love, loves the garden. We put flowers in and vegetable beds, and, and I can remember digging in the back and, and coming across this, this gray dust 
in the soil. You know, and I, and I, and I, at the time I was like, wow, this is, I, okay, I guess this is North Carolina soil. And, and I wonder now, was, was, I, was I digging in, a, in coal ash that was laid as a foundation underneath the subdivision that I was in? Thanks to the $100,000 from the state and the $100,000 Susan raised, investigators in both towns have ruled some things out. The Duke University team determined coal ash is not poisoning anyone's well water. They tested all schools in Iredell County for radon and everything came back normal. The task force investigating the ocular melanoma cases in Huntersville didn't find any genetic cause or common denominator between patients' day-to-day lives. They tested some soil around town and near Hopewell High School and found nothing alarming and no obvious traces of coal ash. But the biggest frustration, the overwhelming fear, the dark cloud hanging over these two towns is the not knowing. In Huntersville, there's no more money to continue research. In Mooresville, some grant money is left, and Senator Sawyer helped pass a law this year that directs the NC Policy Collaboratory to assemble a research team to gather more data about who has cancer. But those for sale signs are still up. And I know a lot of people are packing up and moving. I mean, they're scared. They're like, there's got to be something here. Where's a safe place for me to land in North Carolina? People are still being diagnosed. Everybody's so busy with their own lives. It's like, oh, that's somebody else. You know, until, until it hits you, it really doesn't sink in. But uh, somehow we've got to get the word out more and get more research done. If, if it is environmental, nobody's going to say, hey, I did it. It's my fault. So we're going to have to do somebody. We're going to have to do the hard work, do the research. You know, somehow raise some mon- money, get the get the state involved. The state health department says they're monitoring the situation and have made formal recommendations for more research to be done. It just really, honestly, boils down to money. But so far, state legislators have not approved a penny more. They don't care because it hasn't happened to them, but it could happen to them if answers aren't found out. It could happen to anybody. A bill that would have given Huntersville researchers another $100,000 grant never made it past committee. Managing expectations of how government works is the worst uh, message that I have to send, that it does take a long time, that there are no answers right now, that we are continuing to fight. And if I do find that one you know, smoking gun, I will not stop until it's rectified. It's just finding that answer is the struggling and, and hard part right now. So if there's so much confidence that the coal ash has nothing to do with these cancer clusters, why not get Duke involved with these studies? Why not donate to these grants? Why not be on these boards? I think the very best place that we can and have been spending our resources is to ensure that our operations are protecting people in the environment. I I can't imagine what these parents are going through. But that's why it's important for us to acknowledge that emotion. We have to acknowledge that, and then we have to ask that there be room in the discussion for the facts. One fact remains above all else. If something is sickening, killing people in Huntersville and Mooresville, no one knows what it is. We just need more funding so we can get those studies moving and continue to move so we can find out an answer. For now, here's a plea from two towns care. Care that your neighbors are dying. Care that they don't know why. Care that it could be you or your friend or your child. Hopefully another mom or dad will wake up one day and say, I need to do something.